Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex, often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMF aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMF, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organise transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the SEMF Queer podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram, where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms. Alright, welcome everyone to the episode 
five of the Sephilokia podcast. Uh, today we're going to talk about the rise of the podcast. And uh, with me today are uh, Michael Garfield and Kurje Mungal, who are both uh, hosts of very good and very interesting um, podcasts. So welcome, Michael and Kurt. Hey, Thanks. it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's our pleasure to have you. Um, so as a brief introduction to, to our uh, speakers today, or in this case, guests of, of our episode, um, we have Michael Garfield, as I say. Uh, he is a paleontologist, futurist, exploring the intersections of evolutionary theory, complex system science, weird philosophy, deep history, and creative metadisciplinarity. He hosts and, and produces the Santa Fe Institute's Complexity podcast and manages their social media accounts as well as the independent uh, Future Fossils podcast, when he's not writing, making art and music and raising two kids and an alligator is not being that's, that's a great That's a great bio. Welcome, Michael. Glad to have you here. Thanks, likewise. And uh, Kurtzik Mungal is a Torontonian filmmaker who decided to pursue the lens while studying mathematical physics at the, at the University of Toronto. As the host of Theories of Everything, Kurt observes topics on theoretical physics, great unified theories, uh, consciousness, God, free will, all profound questions that we tend to uh, outwardly ignore, but inwardly wrestle with. Um, theories of Everything is one of the, faces, the fastest growing science and philosophy podcasts. Theories of Everything analyzes the current state of Theories of Everything, that is, uh, surveillance of the field of Theories of Everything's pros and cons and uh, relationships between them. Um, to be a part of the discussion, uh, and I do recommend that you join uh, both the Complexity podcast, podcast and uh, Kurt's Theories of Everything podcast. Um, uh, you can go over, to, go over to the search bar here on YouTube and just uh, type Theories of Everything and you'll find it. Uh, I think for the Complexity podcast, you, um, you must Google it and find it on, on the usual podcast platforms. Yeah, or you can find all, you know, a backlog of episodes on our Santa Fe Institute YouTube channel. That's right. Yeah. That's right. And I also recommend subscribing to the Complexity Podcast and then also yours, S E M F Semf. Well, people are already watching and they know about you, but I'm just giving my kudos. Thank you very much. I mean, it's really appreciated coming from you, Kurt. Um, so, um, what's the topic today? Um, we we decided. I mean, we we came into into contact by different means. Uh, Michael and I, I think Michael registered to one of our uh, conferences and, and we spotted him because I, I have been following the Complexity podcast and I was a fan of it. And I actually had seen a couple of the Future Fossils uh, podcast, uh, which I find fascinating because they, they really can go into the weird realms and the, and the more, uh, you know, ponderous and, and, and murky uh, waters. And it's really interesting. And, um, and, and so we, we discussed this, uh, this opportunity to to come and talk about this meta phenomenon of podcasting and what it means to have live conversation, what it means to, uh, you know, have a, an hour recorded format that is, you know, typically, I think most of the people don't really reflect on the fact that all this stuff is recorded. And if, you know, we do our housekeeping, it should be forever or at least for our lifetimes. And, and I think that's something that normally you only attribute to print or text, but now we have actual live conversations with gestures and, you know, video quality is good and so on. So I think this changes things in a, in, a, in a substantial way, and I think it's worth at least discussing briefly what this means. And for us, SEMF, our humble initial steps in this, in this uh, realm, um, we are still ideating what are the best ways to contribute to the, to the scientific uh, endeavor and to the, to the intellectual ecosphere. So it's, it's something that we are thinking actively about. Um, so it's, it's absolutely fantastic to have you, uh, both Michael and, and Kurt, here, here with us today. So without further ado, let me give you a very quick introduction of what the status quo from our point of view or my personal point of view as well is. Um, and then we can uh, lead to uh, your thoughts and, and, and follow up comments and we can take the conversation from there. So the podcast format has been in the race for the last about five to 10 years. Um, currently, uh, it has an expanding market with a size value at around $13 billion. Um, particularly something that I think is noteworthy. Um, so just to put it into perspective, this is uh, absolutely comparable to many other uh, forms of media entertainment, uh, like video or, or movies and things like that. It's, it's a similar uh, sort of ballpark of, of market size. Um, and what I find very remarkable about the, the podcast format, um, beyond the, the origins 
in you know arguably uh, by by the iPod era of, of internet content and things like that. Um, I think what I find very remarkable and what drew drew me to this phenomenon in the, to begin with is the relative uh, prevalence of um, content of scientific, philosophical, or otherwise intellectual nature. And so I'm going to mention some of the big podcasts that I'm sure everyone knows, uh, Start Talk with Neil deGrasse Tyson, or Waking Up with Sam Harris, Rational, Ra Rationally Speaking with Julia Galef, uh, the Lex Freeman podcast, of course. And even I would say that uh, the Joe Rogan Experience, which I'm sure everyone knows, um, which is a very generalist podcast, you know, kind of a variety podcast, has had, you know, top tier intellectual guests uh, with long format conversations in which uh, to the host's content and to their the host interest has gone into all kinds of uh, deep topics and, and conversations so obviously perhaps not the most scientifically uh, rigorous uh, uh, context but still a lot of content of, 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 of science and, and, and even philosophy that it's, it's, it's hard to believe it's one of the biggest podcasts in the world. I guess currently the fact the biggest uh, podcast in the world that has such a prominent uh, display of, of just purely intellectual content, purely philosophical or, or scientific. So to me, this was a, this was a sort of a wake up call a few, a few years ago. And uh, that's why we've at, at Sam, we've decided to start the start of a podcast and at least contribute in this, in this direction. So the first uh, question I want to throw to, to our guest today, or the first uh, you know, uh, thought for a reaction, is uh, how have you um, experienced this, this race? I mean, we're all uh, young enough and old enough to be here in, this, in, this, in the wake of this phenomenon. So how, how did you experience this? What was uh, your uh, uh, perspective on, on this phenomenon? And of course, feel free to add more, more, more data points that you think are relevant or, or some other information that you think is, is worth mentioning. So Michael, for example, we can go to you first. Sure. I mean, I think my relationship with podcasts predates the word podcasts because I used to listen to long form conversational audio while working as a scientific illustrator at the University of Kansas Natural History Museum. And so that has really shaped, you know, the, the hundreds and hundreds of hours I spent stippling illustrations for reptile and amphibian species descriptions has shaped the way that I think about the utility of the podcast because it basically allowed me to pursue my own self-directed ongoing education after I got my undergraduate degree and I was you know still trying to sort out what I wanted to do next in in my career and I found that uh, even though my hands were occupied that my ears were not. And you know, this is a point that I feel is worth stressing about the format. I mean, obviously, you mm. know, like some of the podcasts that you mentioned and, and Kurt, your show and this show also um, are all streaming on video, you know? And so that's, that's a different kind of uh, evolution of all of this. But I, I, I maintain that like what, what, I think has in large part fueled the rise of podcasting more generally is that uh, we're as a society uh, you know the, the competition for our attention the demands on our time and our energy are such that often the only t the only ways I, th I think it's kind of associated with the rise of audiobooks you know people are on their commute or they're engaged in some sort of like manual labor but they still have one sense channel open where they can, you know, they can uh, learn things and, and uh, explore a, a world that does not dominate their visual field, you know? So I, that, that to me is, is really worth mentioning that it allows people that are, you know, on the subway on the way to the office or are sitting there operating machinery or whatever to not have to choose between learning and working. Yeah. Sorry, Carlos, you're muted. Yes, I was just saying uh, this is a great way to put it. Sorry, I was, I was muted. Um, uh, please go ahead, Kurt. Yeah, I agree that people listen to podcasts while they're performing some other activity. So many people have tedious jobs. They don't require creativity or their conscious attention. And for those types of jobs, it's that, that are monotonous, that are mechanical podcasts, not only, not only gives them knowledge, but even some entertainment, there's 
there's an engine. So there is a level of entertainment and informational content that so you absorb while you're doing some unrelated physical task. Sometimes you you put off household chores because and you know you need to do them, but you don't you can't bring yourself to do them unless there's some other condition like, hey, I can entertain myself via listening to a podcast or an audio book. So you can actually not only learn more, but get what needs to be done, done. It's a, it's a wonderful form. You can pause and, and rewind and you can't do that for a live conversation. And clearly live conversations have their benefits there. They may, I, if, if I could put this down to one dimension, they may be superior. They may be the most beneficial form, but there are disadvantages to being live, which is that you can't pause and reflect for people who are introverted and the analytical type. We like to sit and think with a, and we like to sit and think prior to moving forward and then giving our input and and commenting. Indeed, mm -hmm. it, it, precisely, and uh, and that's that's one of the reasons why uh, I thought that having these conversations with particularly the two of you uh, who are invo heavily involved and actively involved in the in the podcast uh, phenomenon would be so interesting because I think that there is a component. Um, of the fact that we are digitally registering these interactions. Uh, as you say, you can rewind, you can play at higher speeds or lower speeds. I'm a fan at times of playing higher speeds for certain speakers and times that I have to kind of crank it down a little bit as well for other speakers. Um, and, and I think this is, this is great flexibility. But as you say, um, it is a different uh, kind of medium. Uh, you know, certainly live conversation has the has the advantage of what we are doing now, which is sort of reacting to each other and uh, changing course. But obviously, um, this also has the possibility to reach uh, to thousands and thousands and thousands of people that otherwise, you know, could not fit in a in a in a theater that they're just listening to us, right? So um, my next point of of discussion, if if you would like, uh, is to. Um, wonder a little bit about uh, the, the pragmatic role of this aspect of recorded uh, format, long, uh, long format conversation, and what you think is the most, uh, perhaps the most um, uh, beneficial aspect of having uh, uh, conversations with leading thinkers uh, in, in cert certainly in some research areas that are very open ended and still ongoing. Um, in terms of what we can do with this for in the future. So what is the, what is the greatest advantage of this particular format for the, the advancement of those fields that are currently ongoing? Uh, Michael. Well, I mean, it didn't seem this way to me at first when we started Complexity Podcast, but it has come to be the case, I think, that my engagement, and I'm sure, Kurt, you can you can reflect on and and uh, appreciate this in, in your own way, even operating as an, an independent, that having conversations with so many different people working sometimes very adjacent fields and sometimes in very different areas, uh, but you're the one that's sitting there researching conversation after conversation, and it's very natural to draw associations between them. So like obviously when the show started out, it was primarily a megaphone for the work that we're doing, mm -hmm. but it became clear within the first year or so that a large p component of, uh, you know, a large slice of our audience were our own people. And that mm -hmm. as the organization has grown over the last few years, and, you know, we've, we've opened a second campus here in New Mexico, and, you know, and it's always been the case at SFI that an enormous amount of our, uh, research network are people located externally all over the world and so it's very difficult now compared to maybe the way it was in the 80s for people to stay abreast of what everyone else is doing and so you know I, I, I think that you know we can elaborate more on this later but I think that really what I see the value of the podcast format in doing not just for people in a in a general audience but for people in the you know the expert professional audience that we're representing on the show is helping remind people of the ways that all of these ideas are networked with one another and mm. identifying the places in between the topics that are explicit you know like when i had james evans of the university of chicago and sfi on the show and he talks about how his work seeks to identify potentially fruit, fruit, fruitful areas of research by bringing uh, naive 
people from one field into another and kind of measuring the arc between different inquiries. And, you know, I think that the podcast naturally does that as a format, you know, that, that I mean, even somebody like Joe Rogan is very quick to call back to other episodes and mm -hmm. to draw associations and to propose speculative links between different topics and different, different expert uh, fields in that work. And I think that that, you know, that's, there's something that in, in that case in which the podcast is performing the sort of network through which it is distributed, you know, that we live in, you know, that our age is characterized by uh, the networked, the, the networking of knowledge. And, you know, uh, you know, people like Brian, you know, said that curation is going to be the dominant art form of the 21st century. And so I think, you know, that's, that's kind of where I see all of this is in, a, you know, podcasting is interlocution, it's translation, and uh, it, it helps maintain cohesion across a network of ideas and, and researchers and, you know, scholars as that network grows. And as we, you know, we're struggling to try and understand how to maintain uh, <clears throat> adherence in human knowledge production. What was meant, do you mind if I ask a clarifying question, Michael? What was meant by the curation quote? You said that curation will be. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, just the decision to reference you know, someone else, you know, a specific paper from a previous discussion uh, is a, is, you know, it's, it's a curatorial decision, you know, who we get on the show, I think, and, I, and I'd love to hear you talk about this too, um, you know, how you choose your guests, because, you know, obviously we're restricted with complexity to people that uh, don't necessarily, they're not part of our research network, but they they usually are, but they might just be people that we thought were interesting enough to invite to speak at the Institute. And so we have this profusion of, of possible guests, even with those constraints. And so, you know, how do we string a series of episodes together? How do we explore the this like enormous idea space? And, you know, I think uh, a lot of shows, it's kind of to use an SFI flavored term it's kind of stochastic you know like it's just like who who can you get there is some element of that um you know because these are busy people that we have on the show but i think that you know it's been great in 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 and i, I see this in your show i see you following an idea and selecting guests and you know to in order to you know to per, to prosecute a particular line of inquiry yeah, so, yeah. i agree <laughs> so what was the question again, Carlos, if you don't mind? Yeah, the question well, is... I, I believe that we, we already fractalized a little, and uh, but I think that the, the, original, the original point that I didn't hear from you was uh, how did you experience um, the... Uh, sorry, not how do you experience, but how do you uh, see the podcast format contributing to, the, to this uh, you know, advancement of, of the fields that are open-ended, they are currently ongoing and... and so on. Okay. Okay. So, so firstly, there are several downsides to podcasts compared to scientific, like academic research or what the way it's traditionally done in the, in the academy, which is, well, PowerPoint presentations and PDFs are far better for conveying equations. And so there's this book called the emperor's new mind by Roger Penrose and the audio book. Have you heard the audio version? No. Any? No. Okay. Don't. It's, it's one of the worst audiobooks, And the reason it has nothing to do with Penrose, it's because they try to say aloud several equations after one another. And you're left so frustrated. You're left more confounded than you are illuminated. And then you, it just, it's, it's like, so yeah, well, I'm not going to even reiterate. You can imagine yes. page after page. Okay. So like you want to dispel some darkness, not, not put yourself in, into it mm -hmm. and, and the podcast format can do that for certain types of knowledge. Okay. So those are the downsides. Then the, then here's what I see as some of the positives and where podcast contributes to the scientific discourse. Terry Tao said that there is three stages to learning. There's number one, the first stage, which is you learn some concept at a bleary level, like a first pass. So it's like the, the first order. 
So for instance, you'll learn that, or you'll be told that a particle is a wave and a, and a, sorry, that a, an electron is a particle in a wave. And then you're like, oh, that sounds so cool. Okay, then the second one is, well, what does that mean mathematically? So the rigorous stage. And then number three is the post-rigorous stage where you no longer need the, well, you always have to verify with the rigorous stage, but you can now, you know it enough that you can make large intuitive leaps. Yeah. So I try with the Toe podcast to be stage two. Now, obviously it fails because it's it's nowhere in PDF form. It's nowhere like a PowerPoint presentation, but I think most podcasts are stage one in the sense that they give you a large introduction. And if anything, then Toe, if it fails at being stage two, what it is, it's, it's, it's what gives you the motivation to go from stage one to two, which maybe is itself a stage. So it gives people an interest to then learn something rigorous. And probably you all have the same comments where people say, I, I've been interested in math and physics my whole life, mm. and now, I'm, now I want to get a degree in it. Or I've never been interested in, in it, and now I can learn it, and I didn't think that I could. So this motivational aspect is something that shouldn't be underestimated when it comes to podcasts as well as podcasts and well video in general has the 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 effect of conveying knowledge superior super, in a more superior manner than purely textual approaches and this is known in psychology so there's there's some terms like i i i, I I don't know, whatever, dual code, you, you would know this dual coding theory and, and, and picture superior, picture superiority effect. And so the combination of reading and watching is best for learning rather than just any one of them alone. And, and by the way, when I say watching, I, I include listening, like I don't, I don't, I'm not excluding just the audio versions of podcasts. Then, then there's obviously, I think both are necessary. It's like you need underwear and pants not just a shirt and you can't just go out with a shirt without underwear and pants like the, that's that's we both agree and the law agrees that that's not something that should be pursued right. so so i think uh, yeah i think that's i think that's why well that's one of the ways there, there are several other ways i thought about this question for quite some time yes after well quite some time as in when you first posed it to me yeah. And so I have many thoughts, they're scattered and they're not in a thesis format. Mm -hmm. No, I, 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 I like your answer a lot, uh, Kurt, because um, I, I love your reference to uh, Terry Tao's uh, three stages of learning, because I feel like it, it articulates quite well how I am thinking about our own podcast, the, the Senfilokia podcast that we do here at Senf. But also um, it, it really kind of explains to me why I enjoy different post podcasts or different materials for different reasons. And uh, just to just to uh, follow up on your on your uh, positioning that you say that uh, the Toad podcast is uh, sort of between stage one and stage two or wants to be stage two and so on. I would say that my dream is that the Senfilokia podcast that we do here is aiming at stage three in, in a way that uh, it, obviously your audience is much smaller from the get go. We're not aiming to grow. I mean, growth is never our, our goal, but we our, our aspiration is really to try and get the people who, you know, you want to be the, the last uh, step in the catalysis uh, reaction where you're, you're actually birthing uh, new connections and, and new ideas right i mean obviously it's a, it's a it's I a agree. very it's I a agree. very uh, i mean uh, grandiose way to put it but and and we we're very humbly trying and we don't have any any uh, you know aspirations to to become anything super relevant but i think that it, it is important that you know what your uh, niche in the ecosystem can be not what it is, because you never really know, but what it can be, right? You need to identify sort of a niche in the ecosystem. And I believe that this niche definitely exists. And um, to go back to what Michael had said about uh, the curation being the, 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 you know, the dominant art form of the 21st century, I, I think that I absolutely agree that there, we're living in a time when, um, I mean, I have, when I'm writing academic papers uh, because of my research, when I have to sort of compile my research, it almost feels like a program that's compiling what you've done for the last few months. And you're, okay, now I have to compile. I mean, you're effectively being this uh, network machine that, that you have to say, okay, so all that I've done is connected to this and connected to that. And you actually go to this uh, website that is uh, connected papers and you see the actual network of the, of the citations. And, you know, so you're very actively, if you do anything of, of novelty today, you're going to be connected to so many different uh, research lines that are mostly ongoing as well. So I think the podcast, as you said, can serve as this distributed 
mechanism to homogenize and try to, uh, not homogenize, but at least a little bit uh, distribute the, the conversation and what otherwise could only happen in sort of pairwise or, or low group uh, conversations now can be distributed very widely and very horizontally, right? So, so that's one of the main advantages that I see, uh, apart from this idea that you can now have different uh, specializations of, of kinds of conversations and try to do science at different uh, stages or at different uh, levels of depth and so on. So, uh, I, I mean, I thought those were really uh, illuminating answers um, from you. So I don't know if you would like to uh, expand a bit more on, because you, you did ask, Michael, uh, how current things of, of um, people to invite and, and topics and so on. Maybe we can move to this particular topic. So to put it in, in a more compact version, let's say, um, how do we think about, and I say we as in mostly the two of you, although I can give my, my same approach to this, uh, how do we think about um, picking topics, picking um, interlocutors, picking uh, even the sequence of release, if that's relevant at all for us and things like that when it comes to, to podcast? I can answer both in the same question, please. in the same answer. Go ahead, please. So, so firstly, well, sorry, respond to both. Firstly, you said that you're at stage three because you want to help propose, help facilitate research. And I I agree. I like, I, I don't think of theories of everything as a podcast. I think of it as a project and it's just, it's just has the outward face of a podcast. And eventually maybe what I would like to do is become like you all, whereas you all are, you all have this large institute that is research-based and then you have a side project of a podcast whereas me i have a main project of a supposed podcast and i want to do research so the toe pro the toe podcast is more like a project and so the point is an extremely selfish one which is that i want to firstly develop my own world view like something i call the Welton Schauung. It's, it's just a german word it essentially means worldview but then i have a particular reason for it saying that so it's like a theory of everything in a psychological sense and then as a secondary consequence put forward either put forward my own toe although i've i've railed back on the arrogance of, because of the because i see the arrogance in that and so so either put forward my own toe or help put forward a community toe what the heck does that mean mm -hmm. well there's some intellectual posturing there whenever someone says hey this podcast or this so-and-so is a community yeah i don't i don't believe i think you say that I think people say that so that they can get people commenting saying, yeah, this is so cool. They're not selfish. No, you're selfish. And you're just saying that so that you can give people the impression that they're involved. But how are they actually? Well, I have some ways that I would like the toll community, quote unquote, to be involved. So one way is that I do read almost every single comment. And when I heart these comments, the, 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 the toll, the people who watch the toll podcast, and you probably know this about your own podcast but it's not like i read your comments i watch your videos but don't read the comments they give so many ideas and they know so much more than you do especially collectively and so when michael you were bringing up how this curation process allows you to reference other work and leapfrog from idea to idea that is helped by just me reading the comments so in a sense there's the community is asking several of these questions it's just me as some avatar okay so that's 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 one. And now I said I was going to answer two questions, but I, I don't recall the, the second one. Uh, thinking about the, the how you choose speakers and topics uh, yeah, yeah. and so on. Okay. Right. All right. And now because it's selfish in, in the sense that I just want to understand the landscape of theories of everything. There are several. There are, there are way more than I thought there was when I first started because I just thought of it in the physics sense. And even there, there's far more. I think of it in terms of courses in university where you have prerequisites. So in order to learn let's say representation theory, you need to learn linear algebra and then some calculus or some analysis. So, okay, I wanna learn representation theory. Okay, so who do I need to interview in order for me to learn the, the first steps and the second steps? That's essentially it. It's essentially just me following my whims sometimes, but also I have a larger goal and what can help me get there? How can I knock out as many birds as I can with one stone? Right. So ju just to reply quickly to that, uh, Kurt, I think is interesting, uh, an interesting case of convergence in, in that uh, what we do at, at, at the Sanfi Loki podcast or we're actually at the, at the society in general when we organize events is that we, we have quite concrete 
um, learning points in a way. We don't we don't so much identify something that I personally want to learn because this is a bit larger than. And when I say we are a community, I do mean it in in a in a, in a technical yeah, sense. Sure. Uh, not very big. It's it's quite small, but it's uh, it's more distributed. But we do come together and um, and identify learning points, and that's why we normally have questions to uh, to lead. Uh, conferences or, or talks or even this podcast episodes are normally uh, motivated by a couple of questions that are quite concrete in a, in a, in a sense. So I, I very much like that you converged to this, uh, to this methodology of, of, okay, I want to learn about this. I want to understand this. I want to get myself into this intellectual realm. And then you choose the path because that's exactly how we do it. I mean, internally, at, uh, behind the scenes at, 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 at the society, we we try to, I mean, we, we say, okay, w what's going on? So I, I learned about plant cognition, for example, a few, a few months ago. And I was like, oh, this is, all this research in plant cognition is really uh, fascinating. It's kind of new, you know, it's all this psychology and co cognitive science applied to plants. And okay, well, this is a very strange, you know. Um, and, and so I learned about it. I discussed it with some other self people. And then suddenly uh, we said, well, we, we want to understand this better. And so we happen to know uh, someone quite close to one of the leading researchers actually who lives, who works here near uh, where I am in Spain at the moment. He has a lab where he's doing a lot of the, the cool uh, frontier science on plant cognition. And um, and so we just interviewed him. And, and then after that, we said, oh, yeah, so I have these collaborators. And then we a, a few months later, we interviewed those collaborators and we kept expanding. So this is kind of how we do it in, in the background where we, we identify things that are, you know, difficult to in principle parse it's like okay how do you understand these plants making decisions or having memory how, how does this work and so you, you really go after the the, the questions themselves and the, and, the, and the lack of understanding because this is something that we want to for example distinguish from just saying oh we are a multidisciplinary society everything goes you know everyone is welcome i mean we do say every, everyone is welcome but we don't by design just go and throw as many topics as possible and you know let's have a biologist an economist and a physicist just talking you know it sounds like a joke you know and uh and it, it's not it's not it's not quite like that right so it's more i always say that the multidisciplinary or interdisciplinary part of the name of the society which is society for multidisciplinary and fundamental research really is a consequence of the fundamental part it's like you go after the fundamental uh stuff and then the multidisciplinary just comes uh, as, as a consequence right so anyway just wanted to say that it's a nice uh, bit of convergence that, that that you described if i may i'd like to Please. stack on and just sort of double down on the comments that both of you just made because you know this this sort of uh three beat cycle that you were talking about kurt with you know the the learning and exploring ideas you know i i remember hearing a conversation uh with Joshua Ramey, who's a, a philosopher who has written some about how uh, the emphasis on rational cognition in the scientific method kind of blinds people to the fact that the hypothesis selected, like is, it's selected by uh, like a hunch, you know, that there is a moment in, in the, the an otherwise strictly empirical process mm -hmm. where you have developed an intuition about where to pursue research out of this like infinite manifold of possible questions. Yeah. And, you know, so uh, I'll, I'll add a German word to your German word. You know, one of my, one of my uh, favorite historians is uh, William Irwin Thompson who taught at MIT in the 60s and 70s and left to form his own transdisciplinary think tank after that. And he, he uh, coined and popularized this term Wissenkunst, where he said that you know, uh, members of his organization actually sh overlapped considerably with the early membership of the Santa Fe Institute. You had like uh, Stuart Kaufman and, and Brian Arthur and, and folks like that involved. And Wissenkunst was what Thompson called the play of knowledge in the age of serious data processing. You know, it was, it was an attempt to actually uh, like, perform, explore, and communicate the complex systems worldview um, by juggling ideas. And I think that, you know, that um, there, I, and I've, I've spoken about this with SFI President David Krakauer, that, you know, there is a, there is a, even just within SFI, the way that the conversations there kind of work, you know, that 
uh, there's a, a period of very broad-minded ideation. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, the stage two is where you, you know, you formalize things, but then the formalization becomes the basis for another, you know, I think stage three is actually kind of like stage one or can be um, in that, in that sort of three section model. And so, you know, really um, the, the guest selection piece of it, I think you said it really well, uh, Carlos, is that, that uh, you know, you, you pursue what David Krakauer has talked about in terms of Moby Dick. Like you're pursuing these enormous, you know, uh, transformative questions. And so part of what comes with all of that is, um, again, like the, the proposition of what seemed like, well, you said it seems like a joke, but of course you had biologists, physicists, and economists at like some of the first meetings of SFI, and it seemed like a joke then, and now it doesn't, because non-equilibrium economics is finally, you know, starting to gain some traction. So at any rate, you know, I think that uh, it is very much about, you know, throwing things together and seeing what sticks, and that that actually helps people in a, in a, in a uh, general audience. I won't say non-expert, because I think, Kurt, your point about, uh, you know, people outside of the ambit of, you know, particular disciplines often have very interesting reflections to offer. And, you know, for me, it remains a kind of perennial question about how do we fold in the, how do, you know, like, I guess what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that, like, I think that it's better, it's not always better, but it's often better that the kind of conversations that are going on at SFI are made available to the public so that the mode of knowledge creation and of discovery is normalized and that people get to participate in it in some way, they get to model it and, re and reproduce it in some way in their own lives um, in, the, in the same way that like citizen science is becoming uh, important again, or the, the public registration of hypotheses and data in scientific research, even before you know, you've finished your peer reviewed paper mm -hmm. is important. You know, the exposing process uh, is key for a number of reasons. And, and just the last thing I'll say about that is that one of the reasons is that it helps to restore trust between people with expertise in non-overlapping areas. You know, there's this, this, you know, this crisis of trust in the you know this uh domain of scientific expertise right now and if to the degree that you can show people how the sausage is actually made mm -hmm. you know that you can you can help people understand how uh scientific conclusions have been reasoned through and arrived at and you know how how you know people select questions then um you know you're doing more than just propagandizing good research you know, and, and you might be doing more than just uh, opening up a, a field of possibility within which, you know, new hypotheses can be selected. Yeah, absolutely. I, 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 would, I would like to... Um, yeah, I agree. ...to hear uh, some, some uh, follow-up from Kurt, but just to, uh, um, to quickly comment what you just said, uh, Michael, I think there's, there's something very interesting there in, in how, you know, the service... One of the ways I think the podcast can really be a, 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 first for, a force for good in a way or, or a value to society. It's precisely what you just mentioned. In fact, that perfectly leads into my next point and that perhaps we can discuss that and then have a quick break. Um, and I think that one of, the, one of the reasons that I was so enthusiastic to actually uh, start uh, off a podcast and have these conversations is, is precisely that you see the, the, the real-time uh, science being made, right? I mean, this is... I, when I'm in a podcast with someone and I'm discussing an idea that is engaging enough, I'm not, you know, holding back anything. It's not like I'm going to, I'm going to discuss things in a different manner. Like than when I'm here in the, in my home office with my collaborators and visitor, when I go to Edinburgh, back to, you know, the mathematicians I've worked with, I mean, we, I speak the same way that I would speak with someone in a podcast and I think, and I know people and they speak in the same way as they speak when, as they do in private in, in podcasts. Right. So in a way um, I think there, there's this role, as you said, of um, really making the the office walls transparent, right? In the best possible way, because you do it in a you know deliberate manner. You're you're never putting out things that you don't want to be out and things like that. But in a way, the, 
you know, the, the glasses of the, the, the walls become transparent and you can hear from inside the room and the, and the process of science is happening before your eyes. Mm. And, and I think that's one of the deepest values that, in, in particular, your, your shows, I mean, both Complexity and Toe really have, because, I mean, these are long format and you really see things happening. And, and we have seen that as well in, in, in our society, in our conferences. We have some comment, uh, comments in the in Q&A sessions that are like 20, 30 minutes long and they're basically back and forth between two or three people. And, and they are amazing because you see the ideas. Oh, what do you mean by this? All right. And then you see really the edifice building, right? Uh, little by little. So, um, so this leads up to the, to the next point that I wanted to also ask Kurt about, which is um, how, how do you see the... I mean, have you experienced yourself this this particular dimension of, you know, science happening real time? How much do you you said you agree already? So it's not that I'm, I'm going to expect a, a negative answer, but uh, how much do you see this happening and how relevant do you think it is for for your design or your role as a, as a host? Uh, the fact that you're showing the process of science live in a way, the process of inquiry live. Yeah, I, I thought for a for quite some time of, about calling the show office hours instead of theories of everything, because that's the way I treat it. It's as if I have a professor and I'm simply asking questions that I would ask in office hours. And then initially you'll see the question, the question, sorry, the podcast format was extremely stilted because I just ask a question he would answer or she would answer. And then I would go on to another unrelated question. And it's because I'm treating it like I'm a student where okay, you answered question number one. Now let me just go to question number two. Mm -hmm. I don't care about the flow because I'm not caring about the audience in a, in a sense. And, and that's what, what separates our podcasts as well as one other called, called Machine Learning Street Talk, I believe. So I would group us four in these podcasts that are, are technical and and we talk in the same way that we would talk behind closed doors. So we essentially do office hours. We This is what separates us from the virtually every other podcast. The other podcast, and it also limits us, by the way, because not many people like this style or can follow this style or, or benefit from this style. So it's extremely niche. Anyway, so this is what separates and limits us. But, but perhaps, well, you know, Carlos, I was watching this talk of yours about tertiary categories or tertiary relations that is like why why stick to a plus b and why not go to a plus b plus c like why don't we just put three in a relation why do we make it primary that it's two well is it because of a linear structure well if everything's information you can make any n airy nary into a linear structure anyway but maybe that's not best in intuitively or or yeah maybe it's not best for us as humans Anyway, I was watching that and then you said that I want some criticism. The reason why you were doing this was because you want some criticism. And I like that. I think if I could correct what you said or put forward a correction, I and like you can correct me if I'm incorrect. It's not that you you want to be criticized. It's that you it's this is so fun. It's intellectually fun. Exactly. And you want you you like that you have toys. You're not sure which toys will stand up. You realize that your brain alone is not as powerful as as other people's brains or interacting with other people and getting their ideas. So you want to destroy some of your toys so that you can know which avenues are left will be more fruitful so that you can just amuse yourself mentally. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, okay. I, I, think, I think that, I mean, the mentioning of toys is perfect because that's exactly how I feel about specifically this research of, of hierarchy and, you know, these relations and so on. Uh, I mean, they are like toys. I mean, I, I literally built uh, some knots, some links, like Borromean rings and things like that to really physically experience the the, the arity of, of their connectivity. And, and it, it really feels like that when you're working with mathematics. It really feels like you're working with this with these toys. And, and, and uh, just going back to the point, absolutely. I mean, this is one of the main reasons why this uh, initiative, I think, is, is important to, to keep up, which is you know, you throw yourself, if you're, if you have any degree of intellectual honesty, I think you, you, you should know that if you throw the ideas into a big pot of brains, which are all interested in, in uh, growing them, I mean, it is very disingenuous to think that that's not better than just doing on your own and just, you know, keep, keep on going. So, so it's, it's absolutely that kind of attitude. Right? I mean, I, I really don't get when, when, when people get into all these ego fights and so on, because it's like, at some point they need to have a, bit of a less of a, an appreciation for the thing itself because 
you know, when you when you really see the thing growing and you can understand more by sharing and by communicating, I mean, how would you want to, to do that, right? Like it's it's so absolutely it's a perfect description. I, I I'm glad that you that I take the correction, I take the update on the on the phrasing because absolutely that's that's a great way to put it. Now to piggyback off of what Michael said, I just want to I want to agree that the bedrock of the scientific method is conjecture. And it's difficult to build an understanding of the world from first principles. Many people claim to do that. I think that's grandstanding. I don't think that anyone can. Well, I don't think that is possible. I just think that we like to claim that we're more rational than we are. So our mind makes these undeclared leaps and they're inspired by formal logic, but they're often in contradiction to it or just independent from it. And then we use, we, we, so we have this process of idea generation, which puts forward a menagerie of possibilities and then some of them or we know that most of them will die so you need a breeder which is just these conversations but then you need a color which to me is the academic process of actually applying mathematics and going through a proof or a disproof and and i i'm banking that many of the problems that i'm interested in so theories of everything how do you combine so and so with theory with another theory and where does consciousness fit in and so on I'm banking that the innovation will come from the fringes, but then verified by the center. And when I say the center, I mean the whatever's the stereotypical conservative academic place. So you need the fringes. And, and the, in fact, the the right here near Toronto, there's the Perimeter Institute. Mm -hmm. It's called Perimeter for a reason. You're on the boundary. Yeah. Someone said that it wouldn't be called research if we knew what we were doing. I think that many people are afraid to speculate in public. Many academics are afraid to speculate in public, but that's how innovation starts. They do so generally behind closed doors, but not in public. Mm -hmm. So you pursue, you, you you generate something magically and then you pursue it rigorously. Yeah. And, oh, and by the way, this sequential step-by-step -step process that we think science progresses by is only retrodicted. So you already know where, where you are and then where you've been, and then you find some step-by-step -step process to get there. But like you said, hunch is a great word. That's where we get, that's generally how we get from the previous place to the next place. And then we just analyze it to make sure, are we in a correct place? And then maybe small corrections from here and there. Would you like that something, Michael, before we do a quick break? No. And great. mathematically, by the way, there there are many, see, this is something that, we know intuitively, but we don't like to say because it could be thought of or misconstrued as mystical or religious that that it's not that logic is not all that you need something else. Oh, yeah. And even like there, there's the greedy algorithm, which each step looks correct. Each step is locally optimizing, but then it's globally not. And there are many, many other theorems like that, mm -hmm. where it looks like what you're doing locally is an improvement, but then globally it's not. Mm -hmm. So so, so it's it's not always the best to just follow your idea extremely logically and move forward step by step. Although, well, okay, it's not only best to do that. Let me say that. that that's more precise. Right, right. Um, Can I actually stack on that real quick? Absolutely. Do, I mean, do we? No, no, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, also, let, by the yeah, way, we, we, we can. By the way, we can we can pause at any time, so we can close this okay. uh, train of thought first for sure. Sure. Yeah. I mean, something that you just spoke to something that comes up on complexity every episode, practically, which is that, I mean, I see, uh, you know, discovery as a social enterprise mm -hmm. being one in which I mean, you, you look at uh, societies as collective computations, as, you know, SFI is fond of doing. And there is, you know, heterogeneity in the way that people think, you know, to talk about, you know, to, you know, to, to throw a bone to the very savvy title of your own podcast. Like when I had Simon Dedeo on complexity, uh, you know, his work talked about there being different explanatory heuristics, different uh, values that people look for in their, in their uh, explanations. Some people want an, a, a conciliant explanation that sweeps everything into its embrace. Some people want a parsimonious explanation that's efficiently coded. And I think that, you know, there's similarly, uh, you, that some people are very uh, optimized, highly focused in a particular thing. Other people are very noisy, uh, you know, very exploratory. You know, Alison Gopnik, who we'll have on the show 
within the next few months talks about the explore exploit tension and child cognitive development and it's you know so I, I think you're completely right in pointing out that um, you know that we tend to to borrow a term from machine learning we as, you know as we get older or as a field becomes more uh, finely developed you know and, and more comp more comprehensively explored we tend to overfit to you know to, and so you know like uh, Arthur C Clarke one of his three laws was if an elderly distinguished scientist ever tells you something is possible they're probably right if they tell you something's impossible they're probably wrong and so you know this this question of the injection of noise into the machine learning algorithm or uh, of the return of play, which is why I love, you know, the way that Bill Thompson talks about Wissenkunst, you know, that this is playing with knowledge uh, as a way of keeping us from getting stuck in, as you put it, a local optimum. So, yeah. Yeah. The landscape shifts. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, is, it, is, it is that feeling of um, you, you're really working with the ideas that that are brewing and, and so as, as they mature, they become heavier. You know, I like to see it in an ecological analogy where you, you have all these species inhabiting the ecosystem and there are times where, you know, generalists uh, occupy a lot of niches in, in an ecosystem. And, and that means that, I mean, if you just judge by the size of the population, there's like, okay, yeah, this idea is very successful in a way. But when you actually look at the niches, they are stomping on the, you know, the, the, the different uh, dynamics that can otherwise uh, thrive in the same niches, right? The same, same environment, but, but different, different species. And I think this is what kind of happens in, in the landscape of ideas, that, that you have this, uh, this big landscape shifts, shifts that just happen when some ideas get shuffled around, right? And then and, and others are um, sort of um, remixed and, uh, and uh, I don't know, Reproduced. I like to think also of music in terms of music genre and music creativity, music originality when, oh, it, when yeah, it comes yeah. to science, right? I mean, because uh, I mean, for sure, I mean, the, you can create new genres by creating new types of sound, but if you go down to the harmonics and the physics of, of resonance and things like that, I mean, we've been working with the same material for a long time. So how do you explain the fact that it takes thousands of years for for a particular soundscape to develop, right? I mean, and so we are always working with that with that uh, same material. So in a, in a way, you know. Uh, the, the Pythagoreans could have invented, you know, contrapuntal writing, uh, dark, dark metal, whatever. Heck, they could have invented all this stuff. I mean, in a, in a tonal sense, but but they didn't. And 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 you know, they had the tools to do it in a way, but but they didn't. And so I think this is a I think it's a good uh, teaching um, anecdote to uh, or, or learning experience for for us to 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 bring to the to the level of science and the level of, of the industry of ideas and the market, the the marketplace of ideas where. Um, I think uh, it is, I think people sometimes also uh, confuse the authority of knowledge and, and someone who is, as you said, an, an older scientist who is able to, to uh, have a social impact on people because he's, you know, uh, he or she is very established and, you know, accolades and prizes and whatnot. Um, and I think that gets confused with the actual power of ideas, which is, which is you know, lives within the idea itself in a way. You don't have to, you know, you can come up with it in, after a lecture when you're a second year student or, you, you know, all these kinds of things. And um, so anyway, I think it's a, it's a great way to, uh, to summarize this, uh, this, this part of the discussion and, and, and how podcast is contributing to this. But Kurt, please. Uh... Yeah, that's another reason why the, there's the rise of podcasts is that mm -hmm. there's a distrust of traditional media. Ah. So people are looking for alternates. And then also it's it's also not that new. The more that I think about it, the more this long form interview style Sorry, the more that I think about this long form interview style, the more that I realize it's not this contemporary phenomenon. So for instance, there was 60 minutes before on TV and that's essentially a podcast just with commercials. Same with the Charlie Rose show. And I, I watched a, about a year ago, an old Charlie Rose episode. There were nine people on it. So there's on theories of everything, something called theolocutions, which are like, it's like a trilogue. This Charlie Rose had nine guests. Rupert Sheldrake, Daniel Dennett, Freeman Dyson, Stephen Jay Gould, just this dream, dream round table. Oh, I, I don't recall the other guests, but each was just a banger on their own. Three and a half hours. So he was doing, well, it's not as if that was consistent, but it was obviously successful enough that it aired and other episodes like that aired again. So it's not terribly new. What what is 
new is that people can search this now of their own volition and then we mentioned they can pause rewind watch faster whereas before you had to be home at 6 p.m or tape in it's, uh, people don't like to tape that and be, i don't even know if the cassette tapes go up to three hours so all of that's also new and then as i think about why the heck is i keep thinking about this why are podcasts so so popular another aspect i think is that it's, it's simply a trend that it needs no other explanation any more so than why is it that 90s jeans are popular right now? So there's a part that's a trend. That, that may be 20% of the reason. But anyway, I, I just keep thinking, what are, what are some of the reasons why it's... Why, also, why has it not been popular before? So maybe the question is not why is it popular and why is it not more popular? I don't know. <laughs> right. So we, could, we can come back to this point, uh, the, a bit more of the sociology of, of, of podcasts and so on in, after a break of about five minutes or so. All right. All right. See you in a bit. Society for Multidisciplinary and Fundamental Research, SEMF from its original Spanish acronym, is created in response to the current scientific, social and technological environment. Despite the fast communications and interconnectivity of the information age, most branches of knowledge are still largely segregated, and institutions dedicated to their advancement tend to be managerially complex, often constrained by their history and rarely in substantial cooperation with each other. This contrasts with recent developments, showing that today's frontiers of human understanding often lie outside the bounds of traditional disciplines. SEMF aims to address fundamental questions with rigour and honesty, always striving to consider them broadly, profoundly and contextually. We believe that this type of intellectual endeavour is most likely to flourish in dynamic environments that foster the creative exploration of ideas and the organic growth of research projects and collaborations. SEMF aspires to provide such an environment by keeping things simple, staying managerially lightweight and being run by a team of active researchers and intellectuals. At SEMF, we promote rationality and scientific thinking across all human inquiry, since we consider these to be the best tools for development of civilization and the understanding of the universe we all inhabit. Our universalist approach to human knowledge helps us bridge the gap between traditionally disjointed disciplines particularly the familiar yet limiting divide between the sciences and humanities. This mindset allows us to identify deep themes across diverse topics, a powerful asset when trying to unify separate areas of research. Ultimately, SEMF aims to establish a pluralistic community of scientists, creatives, academics, artists, students, intellectuals, and generally enthusiasts united under the common goal of delving deeper into fundamental questions. In principle, all topics are welcome under the SEMF dome. However, given its fundamental nature, subjects such as linguistics, physics, cognitive science, mathematics, complexity science, philosophy, biology, or computer science are well represented in our events and activities. To accomplish our goals, we currently do three things. We ideate and organize transdisciplinary conferences and seminars. We host the SEMF Queer podcast, where small groups of experts with different backgrounds come together to discuss a transversal topic. And we maintain the Agora, a platform implemented on Discord and Telegram, where our members can self-organise and participate in talks, debates, study groups and social gatherings. All the information about SEMF can be found on our website, www.semf.org.es. There you can also become a member in a couple of clicks. In our YouTube channel, you can find our live streams and podcast recordings. And follow us on Twitter to stay up to date with all our events and announcements and find us on most other social media platforms.
right, so we're back. Um, welcome everybody back to uh, episode five of the Semphiloke podcast. Um, welcome back, Kurt. Welcome back, Michael. Yeah, thank you. So thank you. let's move on to uh, our next point of discussion. As we said, we were mentioning about the sociology of, uh, of podcast and to what degree this is a uh, fashion that is going to, that's going to pass to what degree uh, we are, uh, I mean, the, you were commenting on, uh, you were mentioning some of the uh, long format conversations that had existed in the past. I, my personal experience with this is, uh, it, it, this is very specific to Spain because I, I happen to be uh, marooned in, at my parents during COVID because I, I was positive and they canceled the flights back to the UK. So long story, but I happened to spend a long time with my parents after many years. Uh, and so I, I just happened to watch TV, national TV for the first time in many, many years. Um, mm -hmm. And and so uh, there was some uh, terrible political debate you can imagine you know polarized all kind of bad stuff um and then my, my father said you rem i remember in in the early 80s there was a there was a tv show that would uh put on a movie you know a couple of hours and then they would have a panel discussion where they would go out of their ways to invite you know nobel prizes and top researchers and intellectuals and they would have like a two hour uh plus conversation afterwards and and and, and, and you know you could go on youtube and see some of these episodes i mean this is I mean, it's in Spanish, but um, I thought, all oh, right. So there was clearly always a market for this. And, and I think that people get attracted to, to this um, completely organic uh, way of, of, of experiencing conversation. One of the things I really love about your introductions, uh, Kurt, is when you say that uh, your role sometimes is uh, to provide the audience the experience of a fly that is sitting on the wall in the, in the, in the room. I love, that, I love that little comment because it really feels that way. It feels that... Uh, as I said, you're you're witnessing the, the the thing unfold, and and I mean obviously the, the host has the responsibility to make things uh, flourish and go to interesting places. Uh, but um, I think this is this is one of the one of the main one of the main uh, you know points of points of uh, novelty or or differentiation in the landscape of media that people have access to. Um, anyway, so um, perhaps can I can I just jump? Oh, sorry. Go 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 no. go 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 for it. Go okay, for it. you know on that point. I think Plato had the first podcast. It's just it, without audio. And keep in mind, so Socrates didn't write a word as far as we know. And well, one of the reasons Plato implicitly suggests is that there's something about the merely propositional form that's diminutive and deceptive. And you need a, a dialogue or a tetralogue like many more people. And there are other forms of knowing. John Verveke calls this perspectival and proposition and pr procedural and... Mm -hmm and participatory anyway so plato venerated this dialogical form of writing rather than the didactic textbook style like Ar so that existed back then like aristotle but but and i'm not saying that you shouldn't have textbooks but there is something about life lessons research and and other ideas where it's it's best explored first firstly it's best explored with other people Hugo Mercier, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but Dan Sperber and Hugo had a book yeah. called The Enigma of Reason, which is all about that that we we enhance our cognition by thinking in a group and that we think rationality is so that you can alone sit with a pen and paper and deduce, but you're so flawed or at least you're so held back by by doing it alone. And as soon as you add one or two other people, it's not just a 3x effect, it's something like a 10x effect. Anyway, so there's nuance in how people in what people say now that it's being recorded. There's there's you can you can emulate other people, and so you can see where they're going better than if you were to just read their paper, because you you have your right hemisphere involved, and, and podcasts allow for that. And so anyway, I just like the idea that Plato had the first podcast. I just thought, you know, maybe maybe he did. That's a great. Can we sit on this for just one? Please, one more moment. It's a, it's, a, it's a great space you know, to, to have it. <laughs> Right. You know, I think my my tendency is to try and identify continuity rather than discontinuity. You know, in, the, in these questions, it's like for me, the, the less interesting thing is, you know, what is unique about podcasts, maybe. And the more interesting thing is, as you're pointing to, Kurt, is that this is really just the sort of a modern iteration of something that is very deeply human, which is, you know, sitting around the fire talking you know maybe a couple people are talking more but then everyone else is present and paying attention and 
you know, there's this uh, this notion, you know, in the the you know the rational enlightenment thinks of the the individual. Um, other people like uh, Deleuze and Guattari have talked about the individual, the way that the um, if you want to think about it, like maximum entropy, maximal entropy production or whatever that you know that society is is learning to fragment us and fragment systems generally into finer and finerly you know ever more resolved uh, okay. modular yeah. subcomponents and so th this is true of us now right like we no longer in you know in the 21st century west people uh are thinking about themselves more in terms of like clusters of brain motifs and mm -hmm. algorithms and uh, you know influences coming from different you know vectors of media consumption and you know this this notion you know like Ed Young's uh, I contain multitudes you know the, the notion that each of us is biologically uh, a you know a series of nested holes that are participating in, as parts so like all of that matters with respect to this because um you know we uh, you know t t talking about <laughs> uh carlos you know finding podcasts during COVID lockdown mm -hmm. you know that they're they're performing a, f a function that is very very deeply human which is again like you were saying kurt you know the participation in in this this process of what you know verveke calls sense making and when we are separated from one another by the compartmentalization of the human life and, you know, and of the various, you know, processes therein, that um, I, I, I don't know about you, but I saw my job for the Santa Fe Institute doing social media and my job for the Santa Fe Institute doing podcasting kind of uh, flip in their relative importance during COVID, you know, mm. where it's like, uh, suddenly podcasting became far, far more important. Um, and I think part of that was helping people uh, feel as though they were uh, there, like you said, like the fly on the wall. But also there's, I think that, you, like you also said, they invoke uh, or they elicit more of a participatory response. And so the, the, I think, you know, one of the, the nice things about the format is that um, it doesn't demand that someone consume it passively, but it allows for people to consume it passively. And so you're able to reach a broad spectrum of personality types mm -hmm. that, um, you know, that are either interested in lurking or are interested in, in, you know, emailing you after the show and providing, you know, pages of feedback. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And, and, and so, yeah, it's like, how can we, um, there's, and then just the, one more thing to add to that, because you're talking about uh, this, um, you know, kind of wandering through a field of knowledge. And I was just uh, in a Twitter kind of discourse with Jessica Flack at SFI and then a, a philosopher, Greg Priest. And we're talking about Emerson and the essay and that, you know, uh, Greg Flack Priest or Graham about, Priest? Greg Priest. Oh, okay. um, um, or he's a hist he's a philosopher of science. He's a, a sure. historian who looks at Darwin and and um, I, th I hope I'm describing him accurately. But at any rate, he uh, the the two of them were talking about the essay as uh, a way of exploring a transitional surfaces. The way that you know that Emerson talked about it, and it reminded me of this hugely influential concept in my own life, which was the theory of the derive by Guy Debord. Uh, who talks about a mode of experimental behavior linked to the conditions of urban society, the technique of rapid passage through varied ambiances, landscapes, kind of a psychogeographical exploration. And he says that this, specifically that this is a group activity, that you can do it alone, but it's more interesting when, as he puts it, different groups' impressions make it possible to arrive at more objective conclusions. So again, we're seeing you know, the sort of the logic behind nth person verification uh, you know, beyond simply the way it manifests as third person uh, empiricism, you know, as as a kind of a, a default for the way that, that we think together as people. And so, yeah, I think it's just end rant. Right. So um, I I completely agree with that with that perspective. In fact, I normally to emphasize that that um, communal uh, lived experience kind of approach, I sometimes like to flip it uh, on its head and say, 
well, what if objectivity is just the the intersubjective experience that you have when when such an activity is happening, right? I mean, it, it, I mean, you you can open all kinds of kinds of worms if you go down that pathway, but um, I think it's, I mean, there is some there is some interesting uh, inter intellectual uh, rooms to to visit when when you consider that. Uh, mathematical truth. I mean, I am a working mathematician. I would say that's my profession. And, you know, when people ask me about, uh, oh, you're a mathematician, then surely you understand what, you know, truth means and you're dealing with things that are true or not. I said, actually, I have no idea. <laughs> you know, like, uh, that's not what I work with. I work with information that is f fundamentally easy to communicate and that is easy, easy, easy to agree on. And so when I see the podcast as this, uh, or the live conversation, long format conversation uh, uh, as this, um, very, you know, emergent, uh, complicated, multi-layer um, uh, exploration of ideas. Uh, I normally see the the, the germs of, of what's beneficial intellectually in that sphere already in things like mathematics. I mean, you, when you sit down to solve some some logical system of, of symbolic relations, um, what I'm, I mean, the reason why I think it, it makes sense is because if someone else reads it, then can, they can follow, right? So it, in a way, it's sort of um, compiling and condensing this this process of communication and verification, as you said, that uh, that um, is distributed. So I like to sometimes just flip it on its head and say, well, actually, I, mean, I, I could very very happily define mathematical truth as, as just absolute convention, and, and and that doesn't that doesn't detract from the power it has. It's just it's just a, a, a fact that you can that you can do so, right? So it's 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 very interesting. I mean, that way you can link all the way from the high level conversation podcast to all that all the, all the way down to okay proof in a line uh, line in a proof of a theorem you know in a textbook or whatever it's it's very it's very fundamental in that sense yeah people people think that okay so that's interesting that you said people here you're a mathematician so therefore you must know about truth and so on and so what they're doing there is they're saying well mathematicians have a high intelligence a high iq and then they associate a high IQ with just knowing more generally. And and there's this book called The Intelligence Trap, which I, I'm so fr frustrated with. I, I dislike this book, but I, I love it at the same time. And I've never had a book give that to me. And it's like, I don't even want to say the the the, the book because like I, I dislike it so much that I don't want it to get press, but I like it at the same time. Anyway, there's many. The reason why is that I feel like much of it is is I don't we can talk off air why. So there's some there are many studies in it about how being intelligent has comes with it certain traps that aren't there when you're when you're less intelligent and then they just associate IQ with intelligence. Okay. Okay, so why was I saying that? Ah, uh, uh okay, so I I would say that what I'm what I if I was to do some if I was to be advocating for something for, with toe it's it's an it's an exhortation to be a generalist, not just a generalist and not just a specialist, but it's some generalist specialist. Somehow we need both. But then how how the heck can we do both? Because to be a specialist takes it's difficult. Firstly, like you know, Carlos, you spent years and years, and you're you're a specialist. You you also have a wide breadth of knowledge too. So it's difficult. It it also takes plenty of time. You need funding. So who the heck is going to pay for you? So that's why. It, it's difficult to be independent because it's difficult to find someone dependent paying for you, let alone doing it on your own. But somehow we need, or I think that we need a generalist specialist. And, and maybe that's why To and, and Semf and, and the SFI have to be, have to genuinely be a community effort because it, it makes, it's, it's, it's all, it's probably impossible for someone, some person to be a gener a generalist specialist, but yeah. it may not be impossible for a collective to be. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. I mean, we'll I, I on that. yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I think, in fact, uh, I, I will I will mention. Uh, I'm sure many people in the audience uh, who who has followed uh, the society in the last couple of years will know Alvaro, who is the uh, the secretary of the society right now. Um, a dear friend of mine, uh, he, he, I would describe uh, as a, as a specialist generalist, I mean, uh, or generally specialist, I don't know which order you, you said, uh, but, uh, but I, I mean, I think he embodies this, this, uh, this profile quite well in, in that he's, he's had a, an, an interest in the, in the depth of interconnectivity and the, and the breadth of, of, 
of, of knowledge. And, and I would say that, as I said earlier, that my call to the breadth instead of the depth has been a, has been a result of the depth in a way. Like I always wanted the depth and, and I said, well, actually in certain areas, the only way to probe down is to probe wide. <laughs> and, and that's, that's, that, 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 that's so interesting. Now, Michael, have you found that to be the case that in order to study one thing, effectively you need to learn more and more and more and then how far does that go does it mean that to know one thing ultimately you need to know everything what does that mean is this an ill is this a well-defined question is you hear this that that the universe in a grain of a sand sorry yeah a grain of sand and and i also tend to i've had many intimations that in or, that by studying one thing to its ultimate conclusion or to its ultimate or to its penultimate you incorporate more and more to the point where studying one thing or pursuing one path is is somehow incorporates the rest or is not diminished or doesn't diminish the rest no 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 somehow incorporates the rest and this is why that some people would say well toe is so analytical well firstly I do so much experiential work behind the scenes, like someone I interviewed, someone named Thomas Campbell, who said, you need to meditate in this way for six months to understand what I'm saying. So then I did. I'm like, GG is that, man. I, I dislike uh, not interviewing that guy again. <laughs> but anyway, so anyway, I was talking to someone else <laughs> on a podcast and she's like, yeah, you're this. You can't have an analytical approach to an experiential problem. I don't know. I don't know if that's true. I think you can have an experiential approach to an analytical problem. I don't know what that looks like, but I, and I also don't know if it's true that you can have an analytical answer to an experiential problem, but I don't see it as being irrefragably distrue or untrue. Anyway, so I'm curious if curious what you think. I'm sure Michael doesn't, doesn't, doesn't see a, a stark divide between the two. I mean, I haven't heard you in the, from, from right. future fossils. So please uh, give us your thoughts on that. Yeah, and I mean, I'll speak now as a as a person rather than as a representative of an organization devoted to the production of formal mathematical models. You know that there's there's, um, you know, that's a very clearly prescribed ecological yeah. niche within this larger process that we're describe that we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. But you know, I I did my graduate study under Sean S. Bjorn Hargens at John F. Kennedy University, and in a program devoted to meta theory. And you know methodological pluralism, and you know I came out of that program with a very strong conviction that nothing is off limits to any given methodology. That you know, I mean, if you look again at the Mind and Life Institute, which was in some ways a spin-off of William Irwin Thompson's Lindisfarne Association, and brought meditators together with neuroscientists for the first time to do research that correlated the phenomenology of meditation with you know, actually looking at a brain scan to see what's going on uh, anatomically and behaviorally in the brain mm. during these, you know, the experiences these people are reporting. And you know, uh, if, if we edge back closer to SFI and the history of complex systems science, there's a very thick uh, vein of thinking about you know, the, the formalizations of, uh, you know, cognitive agents uh, as, you know, agents that are having an experience. You look at like Francisco Varela and Umberto Maturana talking about autopoiesis, you know, and so it, it, this, this sort of approaches perhaps asymptotically, but it, it approaches at least the notion that um, there is an experiential and an analytical position on literally anything and everything. And that you you can you know the 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 formal framework that that Sean Espier and Hargens elaborated was one in which you you kind of you have a calculus basically of being able to take a first person perspective on a third person thing on a first person thing and so on you know that if you think about um, you know the the intersubjectivity and like second person validation that's uh, a, you know, first person plural research domain. Empiricism would be, you know, kind of a third person singular. Uh, the functional relationships in, uh, uh, you know, systems sciences are third person plural, but you can take a third person plural view of something like the brain, right? At the same time that you're having a first person singular experience of it. And so, you know, to me, the most, some of the most interesting, uh, unexplored areas 
in between fields are not simply between fields that are similarly mathematizing their results and their thinking, but again, the way, and this really speaks to the, the whole conversation that we've had about you know, the function of you know, different modes of communication and different media formats in you know, knowledge production is that I think uh, you know, you, when you pursue something to its extreme, like you know, deterministic physics, right? And you end up in this r domain where phys physicists are making a kind of uncomfortable admission that it looks like subatomic particles are making choices. If you pursue the exact same kind of uh, train of inquiry in you know, a f phenomenological investigation, like meditation, uh, you know, you, like Gautama Buddha talks about, you get to this point where you, you see everything as a web of complex causal interdependencies, uh, uh, you know, a, 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 an interbeing, uh, you know, of co-arising. And so you're, you're, you don't maintain the appearance of uh, like, you know, this, this, exp this experience of, f of free will if you pursue it all the way to its, its edge. And so to me, this, all of this stuff exists on a Mobius strip you know, where if you follow one, one kind of thought to its, its logical conclusion, then you end, the, the piece of tape bends and you end up in a different domain of, of investigation. And so, you know, the question is like where, you know, in this sort of, you know, n dimensional object mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, where do these fields meet on the other side, like over the horizon? Uh, you know, how can we find ways that that transcend the kind of uh, often but not always binary categorization of different kinds of data, different kinds of claims, different different methodologies, and see where they actually um, you know meet up, and and then you know how uh, at the points where they don't meet, how their difference can be a you know a informationally rich or useful um so yeah i mean that, that was a fascinating uh, reflection uh, michael uh there are so many i'm just making a note on what you said you gave me an idea so um, i want to capture it yes um i'm i'm wary of uh, kurt's time um i don't know how long oh, i can i can spend another 10 minutes so okay that's all right we can go for another 10 minutes that's that's good okay so we, we can we can aim for for those 10 minutes. Um, okay, so uh, perhaps, uh, because uh, I mean, as I said, I, I very much enjoy the conversation so far and we, I feel we go on forever and, and it's, it's, it's a great indicator, but uh, how about we uh, spend this final 10 minutes in, maybe you can, the two of you can tell me some personal uh, experience or some anecdote that it's particularly, um, you know, worthy of mention uh, in your in your experience as a as a podcast host. Just to wrap up uh, in the topic of podcast, because I mean, I would love to go into this uh, meta science and 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 how to approach uh, things in general. And of course, I hope that we'll have future conversations. But um, maybe you can you can do give me um, some anecdote, some aspect, maybe not a particular anecdote, but some aspect of of uh, running podcast, uh, ideating podcast, uh, searching for speakers and so on, that has uh, particularly um, excited you or, or that you've benefited from and has made you grown personally and has and, then, and perhaps something also that was surprising, either in a negative or a positive way and, and before you got into the business. Uh, Michael, do you want to go first? I Oh, Michael, Kurt, please. Yeah. Oh, Kurt, please. No, no, please. please. No, 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 please do. I'm going to look up my videos and just see, look at the thumbnails and see, okay, which one stands out? Okay. Well, for me, I almost mean, each of them, it's rare to it's rare to leave a podcast and not be extremely informed. However, I do have an issue. I do have a problem of pouring water into a sieve. So for me, it's like I study so hard for each guest, but then it's much like I'm cramming for an exam and then the next week I forgot it. So uh, the other day I looked up what is paracompactness. It's like something you learn in first year. And then what is what is the a markov kernel like why why do i not know that and and it's it's it, i beat myself up constantly because i feel like an idiot i feel i feel like i should i feel like if i was so for you carlos you are a researcher that's great 
And that helps you retain the knowledge because you're using it frequently. Whereas for me, I use it for a month and then I go on to other guests and I use some of it. So much of it, I well, not much, some of it I retain, but that's my main problem. As for what I love about the podcast, like it's, it's just, man, I love research. I love researching. I get paid to research. I get paid to speak to the brightest minds on the planet and and do so for my home because I'm a I'm a shadowy like I'm an umbratic person. I don't like the sun. I don't I, I don't like to be outdoors. I don't like working with my hands. I like a pen and a paper. And I like thinking. And I just get to do this. Oh my gosh, this is like a dream. Jeez. And so as and as for which guests, it's just it's it's pretty much all of them. I I would say there are just a few that haven't changed me at all. And I don't want to say their names. That's actually that's extremely rude to say. <laughs> <laughs> so. So that's that. Michael, I'm, yeah, I'm curious to know, like, do you deal with the same issue of learning so much and then forgetting it? And then what, what do you do to overcome that? And do you feel like you have to overcome that? And, and same with you, Carlos, but those are just subsidiary questions. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that you brought that particular point up because uh, this thing that we've addressed from different angles a couple times in this conversation so far, which is that that you know, discovery and creativity are social enterprises. Mm. Uh, when I had Andrea Wolf on the show, you know, and, and she's an SFI Miller scholar who wrote a, a, a biography of Alexander von Humboldt, and you know, Humboldt, this legendary naturalist and explorer, lived at a time when science was kind of going through a phase transition where we, you know, it used to be the case that, you know, somebody could be basically a Renaissance man, quote unquote, and know, you know, have this enormous broad knowledge. And there wasn't a kind of conflict between the specialist and the generalist because the, the jurisdiction was so much smaller, you know, that there was just so much less to be known. And I, you know, as a as a podcaster, um, I'm surprised that my amazing expert guests, uh, you know, like I said at the very beginning, you know, they reflect back to me that like it, they find this useful simply because they they c themselves cannot hold all of this in their minds at one time. You know, it's like what is the map of what everyone at SFI is doing? Like none of us have it. You know, the world is just, you know, irreducibly vast, you know, or to borrow a term from Tim Morton, the, you know, this organization much, you know, and much more so science as a, as a whole, you know, discipline. Uh, these are hyper objects, right? Like we can't see them all at once. And so I, I do think that, you know, something that's been really transformative for me about engaging with this as a kind of yoga, as a discipline, you know, in the, you know, in a long dance with, this work is that um, it is humbling. Like, you know, it is amazing to go back to early episodes of the show and realize how much I've already forgotten. Um, that's not fundamentally different from reflecting on my, you know, my uh, academic education in the same way, you know, it's like so much of this is about cramming for tests. But that's why, you know, that's why I've really, uh, you know, leaned into making the callbacks and the networking of knowledge across episodes, such a, you know, a fundamental part of what it is that I do because it helps me to remember and it helps me to help others to remember, you know, because I don't think that any of us are, are really, uh, you know, forgetting is important, mm -hmm. right? Forgetting is, forgetting enables uh, ad adaptability it enables, you know, the, the plasticity of a system. And so, mm, yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, rather than thinking of myself as an idiot, um, although that's, you know, it's imposter syndrome is an easy thing to fall into when you're hanging out with smart people. But, you know, when I realized that everyone at SFI has, has at some point struggled with imposter syndrome because you're hanging out with people that are brilliant in completely different ways, um, then it gave me license to be a fool in the way that Carl Bergstrom and Jevin West and I talked about it in their episode, that, that the fool is, is uh, you know, crucial, that you, you want people that are looking, and it's not, it's, you know, it's not at any given 
you know, it's like you're not necessarily the fool all the time. You know, you have deep, rich knowledge about something. Um, but, you know, simply to be unafraid of asking naive questions, uh, you know, it's, it's liberating. And, and I think it also serves the listening audience. Because, um, like, as you said, you know, the, the deeper you go into, you know, um, disciplinary jargon and, you know, f formalisms, uh, the, the smaller the audience and the less, uh, you know, people are necessarily going to get out of it, except for, like, you know, a, you know, a select few. So, I mean, yeah, I think that really the most transformative thing for me about this show has been a humbling and a recognition that the, you know, in some respect, the, the, the process of scientific discovery is not really about coming to any kind of final understanding. It's really, it's, re it's reified and reinforced for me that science is, in, at least in the domain of fundamental theory, that science is about an, Im an engagement with irreducible mystery and just like standing before these profound questions that you know we can continue to chip away at but every time you do it you know new questions fall out of the rock face and so yeah I mean it's I think it's it's uh, it disabuses me of a lot of my personal hang-ups absolutely it seems like it does for you as well yeah I mean absolutely I think this is one of the if I very briefly reflect on my on my experience uh, hosting uh, conferences and, and, and the podcast and whatnot, um, I would say very much the same thing. I mean, obviously, it's a different scale, different uh, track record, but um, you do have this feeling of um, humbling in the in the vastness of of, of the you know the, the intellectual landscape. I mean, it's okay. So you look to the vista and you're like, okay, I, I love the view, but I mean, there's a lot of ground to cover here if I wanted to, to visit every single summit. And I mean, um, so uh, to wrap up things, because I don't want to, uh, to keep you for longer if you have to go, but um, would you uh, give a, a word uh, for closing? I mean, maybe you can remind our audience about uh, your podcasts, uh, your, uh, where to find you, what you're doing, uh, anything you'd like as a, as a closing comment. Uh, Kurt, where you can go first. Sure. There's a podcast called Theories of Everything. And like I mentioned, I, I tend to think of it as a project more than a podcast. But either way, you can search the term Theories of Everything on YouTube and every audio platform. You'll hear me speak to people who are who who not all of them have their own toll, like Wolfram and Eric Weinstein, but there are many ingredients that go into a toe so i interview those people as well i'm also interested in learning more about consciousness and what role does that have to play fundamentally also is is the word fundamental because you assume reductionism is that even the correct paradigm so if it's it's a podcast about questions and basically the large large questions of life and, and I think I I don't I, I think that's it. To, for just Michael to co to comment on this map that you mentioned, it's difficult to have a map. I I'm so this is why I'm working on a map. <laughs> I'm working on a toe map, and and that's like one of the hardest problems because it's easy to relate certain theories. Like okay, how does SU two cross SU three cross SU one fit into SO ten? Okay, that's fairly easily to show visually. Like there's spin five and and there's different theories. Okay, so you just show those with arrows. But then how the heck do I relate, let's say, the CTMU of Chris Langan to what Bernardo is doing visually? What do I do? Do I put one on a circle like you have a tree behind you, Carlos? Is it on the outer edge? Is one on the root? Is one the hole in a tree? I want to do this artfully, but then but then also, also represent it correctly. One, because it's a fun project, and two, because it helps me relate. And I'm working on a... I'm working on two books. So one will be a popular science book about about paradoxes and consciousness and free will. And then another one that's like a textbook, like a graduate textbook, just on the math of theories of everything. So I'm, I'm working on those three projects. And that's my way of, mid, of, of helping myself understand these theories and retain the knowledge. 
so that's the only conclusion that I could come up with is to to answer the question as to how how the heck can I not keep forgetting so frequently and 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 foolishly and 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 drastically but anyway so that's all that's that's great but, actually just yeah. just to briefly comment on 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 yeah. that idea of a map i mean it's a very brief comment that um at the, at the society we have thought about this idea for a long time that uh, to have a some kind of uh, chart uh, uh, that, that we can that we can read to say okay wh where is this particular research project we want to pin it down in the in the landscape um, so this charting effort indeed has this this complicated uh, aspect to it of like the topology of the drawings and how you represent and it, I think there's a lot of interesting uh, stuff to do there so if you ever want to collaborate and, and just hit me up yeah. we can we can talk I, about I it I am looking yeah. man Michael like and Carlos like I want to talk to you all for so long and I just want to ask you all these inside questions as to how you run your podcast and, and where do you see it going? What are the goals? I want, like I mentioned, I want to do what you all are doing. I want to have, a, eventually I want to have a researcher or a research team hmm. beside me. One to like, Hey, I can ask a question. Like what, what is the, what is the, well, whatever. And, and they can inform me, but also we can write together. Anyway. So Michael, sorry, I keep stepping on your toes. <laughs> with my... No, no, it's great. I mean, and, you know, similarly, I, I have proposed to the SFI press that when we bring a, you know, a, a curated collection of transcripts from the show together, that we run techniques from the digital humanities on mm -hmm. the corpus of this podcast to, to analyze it and to see the structure. You know, if you use like, a, you know, like something like topic modeling, where you can see word frequencies and, and you can trace mm -hmm. the evolution of mm -hmm. ideas uh, over time, the way that you know Simon Dedeo has analyzed the, you know the, the the French parliamentary papers or the proceedings of the Royal Society, um, I would love to do that on the show, and to see you know how my own memory, my own map of these conversations might differ from a more uh, abstract, uh, analytic kind of mm -hmm. map, you know, it's in the way that uh, we're going to end up with like a drinking bingo. Like of all the things that you you don't realize you're you're talking about all the time, uh, or or maybe it will be useful in. I love the way you talk about hamling through that. That it'll be useful in setting a, a course for future s episodes mm -hmm. to see you know what's been missing. You know what have I not noticed has gone unaddressed. Uh. Um, so so yeah, complexity podcast. It's produced uh, by a team of. Uh, one and some contractors at the Santa Fe Institute. Um, I, I'm easy to find SFI Science uh, on Twitter. Also, you know, it's it's that's a group project. Um, you know, so really, uh, yeah, I exist in this weird sort of liminal space, working both as an employee and then, you know, having, you know, being available to you know pursue broad-minded conversations like this outside of the the scope of my work too so uh look me up look us up and um and the podcast is really just a very very small piece of all the things that we do including i should i should really mention it just to get this on people's radars um next week uh october 18th in the evening we're streaming our last community lecture of the year which will be a discussion between um Nicholas Christakis, Jessica Flack, and Matt Jackson about social networks, uh, the complex systems perspective on inequality and, and how we can use complex system science to create a fairer world. And then that weekend, the 22nd and the 23rd, we have the Interplanetary Festival. Mm -hmm. So that's, you know, that's our biggest uh, public facing general audience, you know, a full weekend of panel discussions and keynote talks and avant-garde artistic performances. And that's the event that drew me into the orbit of SFI in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's it's a it's a fascinating and, and profound and very diverse lineup of, of people and conversations. So um, look those up. I'm posting about both of those things on Twitter for SFI all week. Absolutely. Well, we'll, we'll have links to to all these things uh, down in the down in the description uh, here on YouTube. Um, so. For closing, I would just like to say that uh, I hope that we have more conversations in the future. As I said, I'm completely open to for, for the two of you, Kurt and, and Michael. You know, you, you know where I am. An email uh, we can discuss anytime. It's been an, an absolute pleasure. And when it comes to the conversation that we've had today, 
Um, I'm, I mean, this has been a real pleasure uh, for me. I think that uh, it uh, kind of exceeded my expectations of, of how rich the conversation on podcasts is, it was going to be, because when I first thought about it, I thought I definitely am intrigued uh, about this topic of, you know, meta podcast and this phenomenon and so on. But I now want to uh, make it happen in, in some way. Uh, but uh, I mean, this, this did disappoint. I mean, the fact that you two were two of the most exciting uh, current running podcasts that there are out there. I mean, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, confirmed in my belief that it was that it was very much the right people to invite. So uh, thank you very much for being here again. Uh, and to everyone following, uh, you know, we, we are on Twitter. We are here on YouTube. You can you can find us also on our website. All the information is there. I mean, to know what the hell this uh, society is. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you for watching. And I'll see you next time. Carlos, may I ask Michael, a question that will take five minutes and, and may it take five minutes of your time, Michael? Yes, we can or do this live if, if you want. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. So, so one note that I have is that you said something about zigzagging earlier when we were off air and something about David Wolpart and you watched the way that toes zigzagged, but you weren't able to do that before as an institute. So I didn't know what you meant by that. So, okay. So zigzagging. And then number two was you study evolution. Is that correct, Michael? Like evolutionary biology? Okay. You hear that there there are these moments in time, not that, not that you hear, there are these moments in time, generally a few years long or decades long, where a field is transformed, where you thought that the knowledge was fairly complete, and then it's not. So late 1900s, sorry, early 19, yes, early 1900s physics, people thought it was fairly complete. I think there's a lecture on the clouds that were left, which was just black body and the ether. And people thought, okay, I think Kelvin thought, that's it. The he didn't know that those two were saying that's it is complete understatement. Anyway, so is evolutionary biology in such a time? Like, is there something that's drastic, radically changing, like Michael Levin's work and so on? So zigzagging and then evolutionary biology paradigm shift. And if you can answer that in three minutes, because I got to get going. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so to the point about your show, you know, one of the things that it's just, you know, ultimately with complexity podcast i have uh earned the freedom to ask the, you know questions that i personally find interesting over the three years that i've hosted this show i just celebrated my four-year work anniversary at sfi this last weekend and um i think you know when i when i first started the show it was made very clear to me like the board originally wanted the podcast to be hosted by our president david krakauer who for obvious reasons doesn't have the time and so it was a risk on the part of the organization to put me in the seat uh you know as somebody who is so present and so vocal and so public facing and lacks the credentials that would normally be required for my participation in the kind of conversation that i'm in at sfi um you know i'm i'm on the staff i'm not on the research faculty i'm, I'm not a postdoc here uh, but I have been thinking about this stuff since, you know, 2003. And so, uh, you know, so it's, it's uh, again, you know, to speak to my, my being a fool, um, I've found that I've basically partitioned, you know, I, I take it wherever I want on my own show. And I remember that I'm serving a different audience and a different set of institutional objectives with complexity. And yet over time, I feel like those things have grown a little closer. Future Fossils is so profoundly inspired by the conversations I'm having on complexity, I can't not bring it up every single episode. I can't not make my own show a platform for the promotion of the show I do for my day job. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, that it's similarly, I feel like you know, when you get to ask questions about, you know, bringing in like Zen and, and kind of like other esoteric stuff into, converse, you know, conversations with mathematicians and physicists, um, I've historically had to be very careful about that uh, because it doesn't serve the diffusion of complex systems thinking in the first approximation. Um, but again, I think that, you know, there are good, re good ways to challenge that assumption. To the point about uh, comp the you know evolutionary evolution, and I have one more minute. Theory. I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I would just say it just depends on who you ask. You know, um, 
you know, again, it's sort of that to the question of like the selection of the gene versus the individual versus the population. You know, at what scale is change happening? And if you ask somebody who's zoomed in really, really close on, you know, on something, and, and you're going to get people that say that we're going through a massive uh, shift now with like the extended mm. evolutionary synthesis. And then there are other people who say that nothing in the extended evolutionary synthesis was left unaddressed by Darwin in his own writing. So it just, you know, it just depends kind of on where you find yourself on the on the landscape and uh, how how granular you want to get with it. Um, but I do think that there are, you know, massive, massive moves being made in the development of, of the theory, specifically in its grounding in physics and its application to non-biological systems. And, you know, that's, that is a big, big thing that I, I think deserves much more attention and much more, uh, much more understanding on the part of the general public, as well as scientists. So, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. I got to get going. Yes. Thank you, Carlos, for hosting this. My pleasure. Absolutely, Kurt. Yeah, it was our thank pleasure. You so much. Yeah. I knew it'd be fun, but I, I had way more fun than, and I already had high expectations. So I, I appreciate that. Thank you, Michael. Amazing. Thank you, Carlos. Thank you all. See you soon. Goodbye. Take care.